Shalom, beloved of the King. Praise Abba Yahuwah. Here we come again today and we are going to look at our Torah portion for this week. And it's the Torah portion of Vayigash. And it is Torah portion number 11. And Vayigash is, he approached and he came near. And so today we are going to look at Torah portion from Genesis 44:18. To forty seven twenty seven, and then the most powerful half Torah, just my most favorite scripture from ezekiel thirty seven from fifteen to twenty eight and so let us pray, Abba Yahua, I just want to praise you, and I want to thank you, my Father. I thank you for the Shabbat, and I thank you for everything that you are doing in our lives in this hour, Father. What a privilege it is for us to be finding ourselves in the time that we are. When the, when the world is raging out of control, which is what we see, this is a month where there's pr- gay pride parades and everything that's going on in this month. And the world is really just spinning out of control all around us. And we see that people will call that which is good evil. And that which is evil good. And this is exactly what everything that you prophesied in your word that we see unfolding before our very eyes. And it's so powerful to know that in the midst of everything that we see that going on around us, then we have to lift up our eyes because we know that our our redemption draws near. Because we know that Messiah Yahushua is the one who is going to return. He is going to gather his elect from the four corners of the earth. He will put his feet on the Mount of Olives and then everything will be said and done at the last trumpet sound. And so Abba, we look forward and we want to say, the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, Yahushua, come, is what it says at the end of the book. The spirit and the bride say, come, come, Yahushua, come. But yet we understand that before you can come, there is many things that must unfold upon the earth. Many things that have to play out before our very eyes. Like you said to me when in 2019, when I was sitting on the island of Patmos, teaching the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos with a small group that we were with. And you said to me, you will see this very book play out before your very eyes. And so, Father, here we are, and we are going to see mighty things, and we are going to see horrific things, and they truly are in the not-too-distant future. But I praise and I thank you, my Father, because what an encouragement it is to be able to read this Torah portion, Vayigash, for us to understand that in the face of death, in the face of famine, in the face of destruction, you you rose up a deliverer, a deliverer for your people. And you brought forth a man that was going to be able to come And deliver your people from the destruction of death. And so that they would be able to be in a place, Goshen, a place where they would be able to come and draw near, near to you, protected under the shadow of your wing. And yes, even though they still had to undergo three of the plagues, but from the fourth plague, no longer were they going to be plagued. And so even though your faithful remnant will have to undergo many things that will still befall us in this time and in the seasons that we find ourselves in, but the time will come when you will hide your people and you will protect your people just as you did with the Israelites by sending Joseph ahead to preserve life. So I praise and I thank you, Father, for this wonderful testimony that we are reading today because this is not just a story. 
This is a testimony that testifies to us today where we find ourselves. It doesn't matter where we find ourselves in this time, in this hour. Joseph's life is a testimony of a risen Yahushua Hamashiach, a deliverer who came to deliver us to be able to preserve our lives just like Joseph was a deliverer to be able to be bringing deliverance to his people, to many people in the nations of the world to preserve life. And so, Father, I praise and I thank you. I thank you for this wonderful testimony of Joseph's life. How we can be so encouraged and how can we doubt you and how can we stand The only thing that we can do, how do we fear, how do we bow to a world system? When we look at the life of Joseph, all we can do is stand in awe of who you are and what you have done. And so, Abba Father, I praise you and I thank you that this day you will speak to my mind, speak through my lips, the very oracles that comes from your heart as your heart wants to be able to come and open up the eyes of those that are blind and those that that do not hear, those that are deaf, that your heartbeat will hit beat loud through my mouth so that that which your people need to hear, let this message reach, go far and wide to reach the people that you wanted to reach, for them to know That even though destruction is at the door, you have sent a deliverer to preserve life. And so I praise and I thank you, Father, that you alone will be able to open up your scriptures to us in Yahushua's name. Amen. And so praise Abba, Father, that we start this Torah portion looking at Genesis chapter 44, verses 18. And it says, And Yehuda came near to him and said, O my master, please let your servant speak a word in my master's hearing and do not let your displeasure burn against your servant for you are like Pharaoh. And so here, Joseph is acknowledging that the authority that is upon Joseph's life And now he's having to stand because why? We just looked last week at the Torah portion in in, um, Genesis chapter 44 verses um, 12 and it says, And he searched with the oldest first and with the youngest last and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. So Joseph had planted his cup in Benjamin's bag and now Benjamin has been, they were apprehended and Yehud, and it says in verse 14, and Yehudah and his brothers came to Joseph's house and he was still there and they fell before him on the ground. And Joseph said to them, what deed is this you have done? Did you not know that a man like me indeed divines? And so yeah, we are going to see Yehudah, who's going to raise up and stand in the gap for his brothers and especially stand in the gap for his brother Benjamin. And he will raise up and he will stand in the gap for them. Just like Yehushua came from the tribe of Judah. And he had to raise up. And he had to lay down his life. And he had to lay down his life for us all. Just like Yehuda is going to stand up like Yehushua. And he's going to lay down and he's going to raise up and he's going to stand in the gap for his brother Benjamin and for his brothers. And so it says in verse 18, And Yehuda came near to him and said, O my master, please let your servant speak a word in my master's hearing. And so when we look from verses 19, my master asked his servant saying, have you a father or brothers? So from here until verse 33, so from Genesis 44, from verses 19 to 33, we see that Yehuda gives him the story. And he tells him that he is the one who asked him about his family and that if his father has other children, And he tells him how his father had a young man, a young boy in his old age. 
which is Benjamin. But he had another son from the same mother that died. And the only child that he's got left from that mother is Benjamin. And he is the only son left from that mother, that mother's children. And his father loves him very much and tells him that he asked him to bring the boy, which they did. So he asked him, do not stand before me. Do not come to me lest you bring your other brother. And they did as he asked. But if they go back without the boy, it will then bring their father to death. Yehuda can't bear the pain and the grief of his father again after what they saw him go through with Joseph. So understand, they saw the remorse and they were repentant because they saw what their father went through. His, their father tore his garments. Their father was, didn't want to eat. Their father was broken, broken hearted over the, 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 the report of Joseph's death. And they couldn't bear to see their father go through that again. And so therefore, Yehuda is now going to stand in the gap. And so they couldn't bear to see their father go through that again. And Yehuda stands in the gap for Benjamin and says, he will become a slave, but pleads for Benjamin's life. And so that Benjamin can go. And this is the final test. That Joseph needed to see. Was there truly repentance. From the very one. Remember it was Judah. Yehuda. That sold him into slavery. They said well let us sell him. To these traders that are coming here. So he sold them into slavery. To the to these Yishmalites. He sold them into slavery. It was his idea. And so. Joseph needed to see that they were truly repentant from the very one who was quick to sell him out and had he truly changed his heart. And here we see true repentance and humility. And he tells him that he cannot go back and see the evil come upon his father. And here we see a genuine love that Yehuda has for his father and for his brother Benjamin. And that is why it's so interesting because from this very union of where Yehuda is willing to lay down his life for his brother Benjamin, it's those two tribes that eventually make up the house of Judah, which will be the two tribes of the house of Judah and the house of Israel. I mean the house of Judah and the house of Benjamin that will stand together and that is the land that will be given which will then be able to be known as the southern kingdom. And so that's why if we look at Genesis chapter 44 from verses 53 and 54, it's, sorry, 33 and 34, it says, And now please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a slave to my master and let the boy go up with his brothers. And so Yehoshua laid down his life. And so Yehoshua took on the sin of the world upon himself. He bore our sin at the stake. He shed his blood so that we may be set free to once again be restored to our father. So Yehuda is willing to be able to become a slave to, the, to Joseph so that his brother Benjamin may be restored to his father to not break his father's heart. And so what does Yehoshua do? Yehoshua is willing to lay down his life, to die at the hands of those that put him to the stake in order to release us from our sin so that we could once again be reconciled to the Father and so that we may be once again eating from the tree of life with the Father. And so we see in verse 34 that he says, For how do I go up to my father if the boy is not with me, lest I see the evil that would come upon my father? So understand, by this time, there is a true repentance upon the heart of Judah that he is 
understanding that he never wants to lay eyes upon his father and the grief of his father after them having to have done what they did with Joseph. They do not want to go through that again. And by this time, Joseph looks and Joseph cannot bear it anymore and he unveils himself and shows them he is Joseph whom they sold into slavery. So in verses 3 and 4, Joseph says to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were unable to answer him, for they trembled before him. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. And when they came near, he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Mitzrayim. Now imagine, true reconciliation. True reconciliation because when there's true repentance, repentance is teshuva, and to teshuva is to turn, to turn. So that's why we've got to turn the other cheek. We've got to turn. We've got to forgive. We've got to release. We've got to be able to release. We've got to be able to forgive 70 times 7. And now do not be grieved nor displeased with yourselves because you sold me here for Alua sent me before you to preserve life. Wow. I tell you just those words in itself. He tells them not to be grieved because Abba allowed them to sell him to preserve life. So all along, the father had a, had a plan. How many times do we go through things in our lives? And right now, maybe somebody's going through something in their life that makes no sense, that doesn't make sense in what they are going through at that time. And many times we don't understand Abba's plan. But in all things, he works all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And so many times, because he loves us and because he's got a bigger plan and because he knows our love for him he works all things together for good for those that love him and many times we do not know his plan and sometimes we will need to go through difficult things just like Joseph had to go through difficult things Joseph had to be able to endure Joseph was was put in a pit he was ridiculed and hated by his brothers he was thrown into a pit he was then sold into slavery he was then accused of a crime he did not commit he was put in jail he was forgotten for two years by the very people whose dreams he, he interpreted but in everything what is it that we've read about Joseph an Abba father was with him an Abba father gave him favor and so this is the one thing that we do know is that in the midst of everything difficult things will come and people will turn against us just like his own brothers turned against him and many might do many things against us but when we look back, Abba had a plan and our process is to preserve life for those of his kingdom. And so we need to understand this life was never about us. And so when we go through many things, we get ourselves into a state because we think it is about us. We were not put on this earth to serve ourselves. We are not to be selfish about our own little little life and our own little plan. We were put on this on this earth to number one to serve him and number two to serve his people. Those are the two greatest commands to love Abba Yahuwah with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So we are to lay down our lives for our Father and we are to lay down our lives for others. And that's why he says, no greater love is there than for you to lay down your life for another. Just like Yehuda was laying down his life for his brother Benjamin. So different in the selfishness. But look at see how Father has brought brokenness in Judah's life. For him to now stand and say, you know what? I mean, think about what Judah has had to go through. Just think about what Judah has had to go through. Judah, 
had to have two sons that died. Understand, Judah's already been through a lot in his life. And so he's now at a place of humility. And now he's at a place. See, many times when we've had to go through many things in our lives, what does it do? Yeshua learned obedience through what he suffered. And so many times we have to go through many things so that the Father can humble us to understand that this life of ours is not, a, is not about us. It's not for us. We live to please Him. We live to shine for Him. We live to bring glory and honor to His name. We live for His kingdom to come. And so this is, was all about His kingdom plan. And so he turns around and he says in verses 7, And Alua sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to give life to you by a great escape. Yahuwah sent him before them to preserve a remnant in the earth and to give life to you by a great escape. So at this Shavuot that we just had, Abba wanted to set apart a remnant. That was the word he gave me. I have come to set apart a remnant. So understand, this is the Torah portion that would have been the Torah portion of just last week, Shabbat. This last Shabbat that went past. And this is when, just that Sunday before, we would have gone through Shabbat. And so the Father was setting apart a remnant for himself at Shavuot that he wanted to use, that he wants to use in these last days as a remnant to give life for a great escape. Because why? We have to be able to bring in the harvest for the Father. And I don't know about you, but I can speak for myself that since Shavuot, Father has now got me to be able to not be silent. That doesn't matter where I am. I am to speak a word as he tells me to speak a word because we have to preserve life. We have to speak the truth. We have to speak that which he puts in our mouth to speak. Even yesterday, I was at the physio for my back. And as I was there on that physio bed for an hour, I sat preaching to that woman. And she said, when we finished, she turned around and she said, you know, you might think you came here because you needed me. But what you do not understand, you came here because you were sent here by the Father because I needed to hear what you needed to say. So never underestimate what the Father is doing. Never underestimate what the Father is doing in our lives because right now we are to speak a word and not hold back because we need to preserve life. The word that you speak to somebody of a warning of whatever it is that he needs to say might preserve that person in the days ahead. And that's what you need to understand. And so we have a look at Genesis chapter 45 from verses 8 to 12. And so from verses 45 from verses 8 to 12, we see that Abba rose up Joseph to be the master of all the land. And Abba will raise up his end time Josephs of this hour, in this hour, to preserve life. His remnant bride. He needs to raise up the Joseph. So you must understand. If the father has put upon your life. A Joseph anointing. Then it's because you are supposed to raise up. In where the father's placed you. To understand. That he wants to give you the ability. To preserve life. So what are you doing. In order to do that. What are you doing. What resources do you have at your fingertips? What is it that the Father's placed in your life for you to be able to have resources in your life to preserve the life of those that's going to be His remnant bride in the days to come? 
Because if he did not send Joseph ahead, he would not have preserved, been able to preserve life. So what are the resources that the Father has given into your hands that you sit with? That the Father is needing you to do. Because if Joseph did not go ahead with the plan that was necessary for him to play out. For him to be able to start stocking up the food. Doing the work that was needed to be done. Then the world. There would not have been a remnant. Not only from the house of Israel that was to be surviving. But even in the other nations of the world that were coming for food would have also died. And so what has the Father put into your hands to raise you up as a Joseph in these last days in order to preserve life for him and for his people? And so that is why we must understand that in these last days, Father is going to have to raise up his Josephs. This is something the Father showed me 21 years ago. He showed me cities of refuge. Places of refuge where people are going to have to go to Goshens. That people are going to have to go to for life to be preserved. But if we don't do what we need to do, then we will miss the opportunity of what Father wanted to do. And we will not forgive ourselves for the fact that people will die around us because we did not do what we needed to do. If Joseph was not obedient, life would not have been preserved. And so Joseph, there's going to be the Josephs of this hour that need to raise up to preserve life. And this will be to preserve the life of his remnant bride that has been set apart to do his work and to set up his places of refuge around the world to protect his true sons and daughters from the destruction that is coming on the earth. Abba will have his Goshens where his people will be protected and set apart. But if people are not going to raise up and be obedient, Father can only work with what we are willing to surrender. If we surrender, then he can use us. But if we're still holding on, he cannot use us. Genesis 45 from verses 15 to 18, we have a look and we see that Yah, Joseph kisses his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers spoke with him. And the report of it was heard by the house of the Pharaoh, saying, The brothers of Yosef have come. And it was good in the eyes of the Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants. And the Pharaoh said to Yosef, Say to your brothers, Do this, load your beasts and go, enter the land of Canaan. And take your father and your households and come to me and I give you the best of the land of Mitzrayim and you eat the fat of the land. Wow. So we see that now the favor of the father is upon Joseph's life. And because of the father's favor is upon his life, he has favor with the Pharaoh. And so the father has raised up Joseph. And so understand, because of the blessing of the father upon Joseph's life, Abba blessed the house of Israel because of the favor on Joseph's life with the Pharaoh. And so when Abba raises up someone, when, jo when the father raises up a person that he's using as a leader, as one who's been a forerunner for the Father, one that is breaking ground, one that is a forerunner for the Father, just as Joseph was. Joseph had to be able to break ground. And so when the Father raises up that leader, then the favor of the Father will be upon them. And that every, when, when the Father raises up a leader, a person, even the people around them will be blessed because of the favor that is on that person's life. There will be the blessing and there will be favor. Then we look at Genesis chapter 45 from verses 20 
to 24. And so Abba goes before the children of Israel and he goes before us and will provide for all of his people. He will provide for his remnant in a time of famine and destruction. He will go ahead of us. And so we see that in verse 20 it says, Do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of the land of Mitzrayim is yours. So understand, they're not just going to come into Mitzrayim, they're going to have the best of the land. And the sons of Israel did so, and Yosef gave them wagons according to the mouth of the Pharaoh, and he gave them food for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments and to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and the changes of garments and so now they're going to go forth and so by the time we get to chapter 46 from verses 2 Alua spoke to Israel Yaakov to Israel in the vision of the night and he said Yaakov, Yaakov and he said here I am and he said, I am the owl, the allure of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Mitzrayim, for I shall make you there into a great nation. And so he takes, he is now going to bless Yaakov. So you see, in all things, we need to hear the voice of the father. And so by this time, the brothers return. They come and they tell the father that Joseph is alive and that Joseph is sending them now and that the Pharaoh is going to give them the best of the land in Mitzrayim for them to be able to dwell. They don't need to die in the famine. They don't need to worry because the famine is going to become even more severe. And so Joseph has gone ahead of them to preserve life. And now Father is giving Yaakov, Israel, the blessing to say, go forth, I am with you. And so in all things, before we move, we must hear the voice of the Father blessing us because he's the one who's going to go before us. He's the one who needs to go before us and he's the one who needs to bless us as we go. And so it says in verse 4, I myself am going down with you to Mitzrayim and I myself shall certainly bring you up again and let Yosef Put his hand on your eyes. And so we see that Jacob has got the father's blessing. And you see, as long as he goes before you, what do you have to fear? I will be with you. I will go with you. And then I will bring you back. So the father will send us to where we need to be. No matter where he wants us to go, the important thing is, is he with us where we are going? And so when we look at Genesis chapter 46 and we now have a look at verses 28 and in Genesis chapter 20, um, you know, now it tells you about all the tribes. So here it talks about all the, the tribes of the house of Israel, these 12 tribes, you know, it's 11 tribes, well, 12 tribes because Benjamin is still Joseph is the only one that is not part of this, but eventually all 12 tribes are now going to be together as a people that is going to come forth where the house of Israel is now going to come forth out of Mitzrayim, where eventually they're going to come out of Mitzrayim as a people that's going to be known as the people of Israel. And they are going to be made up of the 12 tribes of the house of Israel. And so it's going to tell you, we're not going to read through all of this, but every single one, it's Reuben and then Levi and then Yehuda. And um, so it's the whole house and all the children that comes out. And so in verses 28, it says, And he sent Yehuda before him to Yosef to point out before him the way to Goshen. And they came to the land of Goshen. And so in all... It was 70 people that were coming out. The sons of Yosef were born to him in Mitzrayim were two beings. All the beings of the house of Yaakov who went to Mitzrayim were 70. So together they were 70. And so here they come into Goshen. 
And so as they come into Goshen, um, who goes? who is the one who goes ahead? Judah is the one who goes ahead. And here we see again how Yehuda is taking the lead as he will become the tribe by which the nations of the earth will be blessed. They will have favor through Yehuda because Yehuda is the one that's taking the place now of the firstborn because the firstborn was Reuben. But now the father is going to raise up Yehuda because out of the tribe of Yehuda all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through Messiah, Yehushua. And so now they come into the land of Goshen. And so by the time we get to verse <clears throat> by the time we get to verse twenty nine, we are going to see how the Pharaoh gave them so Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to Goshen to meet his father Israel and he appeared to him and fell on his neck and wept on his neck a long time and Israel said to Joseph now let me die since I have seen your face that you are still alive so the place that was made ready for them remember the Pharaoh said that he is going to give them the best land and the land that he gives them is the land of Goshen the Pharaoh gave them the best land the land is called Goshen now it's interesting this is a very important name because Goshen means drawing near so do you see who are those that are going to be in a Goshen the only ones that are going to be protected in a place called Goshen are those that are going to draw near to him how significant this place Goshen is going to mean in the days ahead. We need to draw near to Yahuwah. He will save his people. Those that will draw near to him. We need to come closer and trust him. So you see, if we're not going to come into intimacy with him, if we do not draw near to him, we are not going to be protected in our Goshens in the days ahead. So the, the, the people that he's going to protect in the Goshens that are ahead of us, in the time that is ahead of us, in the Goshens that we're going to go into, they are the people that will enter into an ark, the ark of his presence, because they draw near to him. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. We need to draw near to the Father and he will draw near to us. And so when I read this, this really just reminded me how not just this this last week, not this week that's gone by, but the last week, um, when I was sitting at the Sea of Galilee, it just, it was so beautiful to have spent that time at the Sea of Galilee. And so as I was there, it was the Father speaking to me and saying, my child, come out into the deep. So while I was there, Father started to speak to me as I was swimming in the Sea of Galilee and just meditating on my Messiah meditating on the fact that this is the very place where he walked on the water this is the very place where he called his disciples from that place he called his disciples forth and now in this very place here he's standing and we go to a, a, a to an account that happened in Luke chapter 5 which really reminded me of this Goshen of drawing near to him and so let's go to Luke chapter 5 and in Luke chapter 5 and we will read from verses 4 and it says and when he ceased speaking he said to Shimon pull out into the deep and let down your nets and so verse 3 it says and entering into one of the boats which belonged to Shimon he asked him to pull away a little from the land and he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat and when he ceased speaking so now when he finished speaking to the crowd that he was speaking to, he told Peter, come out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. So this coming out into the deep is the same as where we need to draw near to Yahuwah. 
So when he said to me, come out into the deep, when you come out into the deep, you are coming away from the crowd. You are coming away from the land. You are coming away from everything that is the destruction. He has just finished speaking to the multitudes, that the people that were there on the shores. And now he tells him, come out into the deep. Draw away. Come away from the noise. Come away from the things of this world. Come away from the way that you know how to do things. Come away and draw near to me. Come out into the deep. To come out into the deep means that you're coming further and further away from where the land is. Where you are secure in the land. And now you're coming out into the deep where it is not so safe there as it is deep there. And now you need to draw closer to him. The, you no longer can hear the hustle and the bustle of what is going on on the land because you're now coming deeper in with him. And then he says, pull out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. So now what is he saying? Come out into the deep. Come away from the noise and the hustle and the bustle of what's on land and let down your nets and do things my way. Let down your nets. Do things my way. And then Shimon answering said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught none. But at your word, I shall let down the net. You see, at your word, are we taking the Father's word? Are we taking the Father at his word? Are we being obedient to the Father? Because we are in an hour right now. Right now, the hour that we are going to find ourselves in right now is the hour of where we are going to have to take him at his word. To come out into the deep is going to be a time of when we are now going to have to draw near to him, to be set apart by him, to be set apart from those things of the way that we know how to do things, of the familiar that is around us, and to be able to come and throw our nets for a catch. And do things his way. And hear what he says. And even though it does not maybe make sense to our mindsets, maybe make sense to what we want to do and how we know how to do things, but we are no longer in our familiar territory on land. We are now out in the deep of the sea. And now we're going to have to do things his way. Because we need to draw near to him. And we need to come out into the deep with him. And we need to be able to be obedient to his word. Shama. To hear and to obey. Because that is what is going to preserve our lives in the days ahead. To hear and to obey. Not to fear. Not to reason in your mind. Not to say, but you know what? You don't understand. I've already done this before. I've already gone this way before. I've already, I've toiled all night. I've done things. I've done it like this before. Father, I've gone this way before. And it didn't work out. And the father is saying, just take me at my word. Which is exactly what he says. Peter says, but at your word, I shall let down the net. Are you going to take him at his word? Are you going to take him at his word? Are you going to trust him? Are you going to believe what his word says above everything else that you see, above everything else that's going around you? Are you going to take him at his word? And he says, and when they did so, they caught a great number of fish. And their net was breaking. If Joseph was not obedient to do what the father told him to do, how was he going to be able to bring in the greatest harvest for the father? To preserve life for the father with those in the nations. And they motioned to the partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they were sinking. And when Shimon Kepha saw it, he fell down at the knees of Yoshua saying, Depart from me, for I am a man, a sinner, O Master. And this is exactly what happens with his brothers. His brothers have fallen down. They have seen, if the father did not do what he did with Joseph, 
where would they be now? They would have not been preserved and they would have been destroyed. But now, through the fact that they were able to, you know, the fact that Joseph went through the process, Joseph allowed himself, Joseph did not succumb to the temptation of a Jezebel spirit, but he stood in opposition. And Joseph stood all along. And through the fact that Joseph had to stand, he was able to preserve life. And now in the face of his brothers, he sees what, they see what the father has done. And so in Genesis chapter 47 verse 6, let's have a look at Genesis chapter 47 verse 6, because everything of what we see, of what is going on, is all, if the father did not allow all of this to happen, they're now going to come into a place of Goshen. And this place of Goshen that they're going to come to is a place where they are going to draw near to the Father, where they're going to see the face of the Father and be close to the Father when the rest of Mitzrayim is going to be going through the great destruction of the plagues and everything else. 400 years later, in the place of Goshen, where they were to draw near to the Father, where they were to be protected by the Father, because Joseph went ahead, they will see the mighty miracles that the Father will do. And so in Genesis chapter 47, verses 6, we see that the land of Mitzrayim is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land and let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know of a capable man among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. So, in a time of famine, so in the time of famine, you will be given the best of the land that the father will give you. So in the time of drought, in a time of famine, in the time of your difficulty, Father will give you favor. Abba goes before us and he will protect us and we will not have to worry about the days ahead as he will lead us to the best land and there he will feed us and he will protect us and he will even give us work where everybody else will maybe not be working. How many how many people have I heard of where companies were closing? I heard this most powerful testimony of where in the time of of um uh, when the COVID hit how this man he had 200 and something employers to be able to pay and the father said I am faithful and I pay wages pay the wages in full and he said father how do I do that these people are not working pay the wages in full and so in the time of difficulty where there was no business, this man had to put his trust and faith in the Father, and the Father more than blessed him. The fact that he did, he was obedient at his word. He took him at his word, and he did what the Father told him to do, and the blessings that came from that. So in the time of famine, in the time of trouble, for those that are his, he will see us through and he will protect us and he will lead us and he will guide us. Now in verse 10 we see, So Yaakov said to the Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life and they have not reached the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of the sojourning. And Yaakov blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. Interesting. Yaakov is the one that blesses Pharaoh. Abba will raise us up and we will be the one to bless the kings of the earth. When you are anointed and appointed and set apart by the Father, the remnant bride that the Father is going to raise up now, they are the ones that are going to speak into the lives of the Pharaohs. They are going to speak into the lives of the kings of the earth and they will bless the kings of the earth. In Genesis chapter 47 verse 12, And Yosef provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with bread, 
for the mouth of the little ones. Now there was no bread in the land because the scarcity of food was very severe and the land of Mitzrayim and all the land of Canaan became exhausted from the scarcity of food. And so in the worst famine, Abba will provide the manna that we need. We must just trust him. It's to be able to trust him and to be obedient to him because it's obedience that's going to bring the blessing. And so it doesn't matter what is going to go on around us on the earth. It doesn't matter what the difficulty is that are going to go on around us because we know that the famine is coming. We know that the day is going to come where much famine is going to come upon the earth and we're going to look at that in Revelation chapter 6. But what we know is that when our trust and our faith is in the Father and we are being obedient in doing what he's told us to do, then he is the one who is going to provide the manna that we need. Even if it means it's going to be manna from heaven, he will provide the manna that's going to be necessary for us to be able to make sure that we will be, that we will have bread to eat and we will not starve. Then we have a look and we see in Genesis chapter 47 from verses 15 to 20 where we see that the day of the famine comes that now the people will have to sell everything. So let's read. And when the silver was all spent in the land of Mitzrayim and when the land of Canaan and all the Mitzrites came to Yosef and said, give us bread for why should we die in your presence? For the silver is gone. And yet Yosef said, Give your livestock and I give you bread for your livestock if the silver is gone. So they brought their livestock to Yosef and Yosef gave them bread in exchange for the horses and for the flocks they owned and for the herds they owned and for the donkeys that he fed them with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. And when that year had ended, they came to him the next year and said to him, We do not hide from our master that, our, that the livestock we owned, there, were, has no, there has not been left any before my master, but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes and we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread and let us and our land be servants of Pharaoh and give us seed and let us live and not die and let the land not lie waste. So you see, this is how the Pharaoh eventually becomes so powerful, the most powerful throughout all the nations of the world because now everybody is having to come to Joseph in order to be able to buy bread. Joseph is the only one that has the seed available in order to be able to feed the people. And by this time, people are selling out. People are basically selling everything that they own, their lands, their livestock, everything, in order to be able to stay alive. So when the day of the famine comes, people will sell all they have and give their lives, give everything that they own, give their houses, give their, their, their everything because they will become a slave to the system because the, 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 the famine is already coming upon because this is what the, the, this, um, you know, this one world um, organization is trying to do, this beast system of the world. This is what it's doing. It's wanting to be able to bring in the famine and so that when the famine comes in, the people will become reliant on the governments. The people will become reliant on the governments in order to be able to feed them. And so they will sell everything that they own just to stay alive. So this is when people will let, will bow down to a beast system. They will sell their souls in order to stay alive. Remember what Yoshua says, if you lay down your life, you will gain it. But if you try and save your life, you will lose it. If you save your life, you will lose it. But if you lay down your life for his name's sake, you will gain it. So are we going to bow down to a system just in order to stay alive. But it's so interesting because just after this, in verse 22, we see one of the most powerful verses in this whole um, 
you know, in this account of everything that's going on. Who are those that will be protected in the land when all this famine is going on? So listen to what it says in verse 22, chapter 47, verse 22. Only the ground, only the ground of the priests he did not buy. For the priests had from what Pharaoh gave them by law, and they ate that which the Pharaoh gave them by law. Therefore, they did not sell their ground. So understand, who were the only ones protected in their land and in their ground? Only the priests. So that is why this remnant is a priesthood. It is a holy priesthood. He's wanting a holy priesthood. That's already what he said in Exodus chapter 19. You will become a set-apart nation, a holy priesthood unto me, if you will obey. Let's just look at Exodus chapter 19 while we are at it. And so what does it say in Exodus chapter 19 verses 5? And you shall be to me a reign of priests, a set-apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. Set up, sorry. And now if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples of the earth, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. So you see, the priests will be those that will be taken care by Yahuwah. And they will have their land. And in their land there will be food because the Pharaoh was the one feeding them. And so Abba Yahuwah is the one who's going to feed his priests. Because he's looking for a set-apart priesthood. And that will be the remnant bride. That will be his set-apart priests. And so eventually when we have a look at verse 25 of Genesis chapter 47 verses 25 and they said you have saved our lives let us find favor in the eyes of my master and we shall become the Pharaoh's servants and yeah we see that eventually they have given their land they've given their livestock they've given everything there's only one thing left for them to give to save their lives and that is to become servants. And this is what we're going to see what's going to happen at the end. People are going to bow down and receive the mark of the beast because they're going to bow down to the beast system. And as they bow down to this beast system, they will then become slaves to the system because the famine is going to come. And that's why if we have a look at Revelation chapter 6, when we see the famine that is coming. So we must understand that there is going to be a terrible famine that is coming with the, 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 the horses that are going to ride and the black horse is the third seal. When the seals are open and there is going to be a black horse and it says, and when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see and look and, and saw a black horse and he who sat on it holding a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard the voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A measure of wheat for a denarius, and three measures of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. And so this is going to be when there's a whole day's wages was a denarius, and that is what they're going to pay for a loaf of bread because the famine will be so severe and so by the time you get to the fourth seal it says and when he opened the fourth seal I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying come and see and I looked and I saw a pale horse and he who sat on it had the name death and Sheol followed with him and authority was given to them over the fourth of the earth to kill with sword with hunger with death and by the beasts of the earth so there will be famine, there will be death, and they will come to kill. And so we see then that 
by the time we're going to get to verse 27 as we end and it says and Israel dwelt in the land of Mitzrayim in the land of Goshen and they had possessions there and bore fruit and increased exceedingly but yet those that are his his remnant his set apart bride that he's blessed from generation to generation from Abraham from Isaac from Yaakov those that he said he would bless, he is blessing them. Even in the greatest famine, they are being taken care of, they are increasing, they are multiplying, and they are blessed. And so now we're going to look at our Haftorah, and this Haftorah is so powerful because this is a scripture that I have declared so many times, and this is a scripture that just now, what was so interesting, on the evening of Israel's Shavuot, so on the 25th of May, as, Shavuot, as um, Israel celebrated their Shavuot in their counting, because they count from the, the High Holy Sabbath, which is, they don't count it the way it's supposed to be, taking seven Sabbaths, they take it from the morrow after the Sabbath, meaning the High Holy Sabbath, which is not correct. And so they celebrated their Shavuot on the twenty sixth of um, on the twenty sixth of May, but day begins at sunset. So that day on the twenty fifth, before the sunset, and Israel entered into their Shavuot. Father had given. Um, my friend Alti an instruction that she was to be able to go up and pray um, at the uh, up on the Mount of Olives. Uh, she was to go and pray for Israel, you know, and stand in the gap for Israel. And so her and I went up onto the top of the Mount of Olives, and we were at the um, the church, the teardrop church, which is where Yoshua would have stood. And where he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I, 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 I long to gather you as a hen gathers her cheeks. So I long to gather you under my wings. And so at that very place, just before we entered into Israel Shavuot, we were there to be able to pray and intercede for the land of Israel and for the people of Israel. And that is all people, not just the Jewish people but all the people living in Israel, including the Arab people, including all the people that dwell in the land of Israel. And just like when Yoshua stood there and how he said they, they missed the day of their visitation and because of that, judgment was going to come. And that was the very word that the Father had given me. And so when I was up there, the Father gave Ezekiel 37 for me to be able to pray and this is exactly the Haftorah that we are going to read and this was declared and I've declared this many times over the land of Israel I've even been on the top of Mount Hermon where the father got me to take two sticks on the highest mountain in the land of Israel got me to take two sticks and write on the one stick the house of Judah on the other stick the house of Ephraim the house of Israel and where the two sticks will become one stick but it's important that we understand this Haftorah because many people are very confused with the land of Israel today and thinking that prophecy has taken place by looking at the scripture, yet this scripture is a prophetic utterance that is still going to happen and this is, there's many people right now trying to join the house of Israel and the house of Judah, where right now in the messianic movement they are, there's there's groups now that are trying to, um, messianic groups that are trying to join together with um, orthodox Jews and coming together to to build this house of Ephraim and the house of Judah to become one. This is not a work made of man's hands. This is the Father's work and it will be done at the time when Yeshua comes back. This is not what is happening in the land of Israel now. And this is the confusion. So we're going to read these scriptures and we're going to understand clearly that this is prophecy that is still to be fulfilled. And this is why the Father is waking up 
the house of Israel. And that is why the Father is raising up a remnant out of the house of Judah, so that when the time comes, he will have his full house made up of twelve tribes when Yahshua comes, and when he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives, and he will come and reign and rule in the land of Israel. So let's read from verse 15, and it says, And the word of Yahuwah came to me, saying, And you, son of man, take a stick for yourself, and write on it, For Yehuda and for the children of Israel, his com- companions, then take another stick and write on it, For Yosef, the stick of Ephraim, and for the house of Israel, his companions. Now understand, by the time that Ezekiel is writing this, you must understand that the house of Israel and the house of Judah are two separate houses, and they are still two separate houses today. There is no one full house today, because there is a division that took place. Remember, Jeroboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam took the ten tribes and went up north because there was a split after Solomon died. Rehoboam, his son, became king. And he put up the temple taxes. And because he put up the temple taxes, then Jeroboam went to Rehoboam and said, Please, the temple is already built. Why are your people suffering now to pay temple taxes? Please take away these temple taxes. And instead, Rehoboam put up the temple taxes. And the father split the kingdom from Rehoboam. And Jeroboam took the tribes, ten tribes, went up north. And this is eventually where he goes and they get lost by going up north. Because eventually he first goes to Beit Al and from Beit Al then he goes to Tal Dan. And by the time he comes to Tal Dan, which is way north, then eventually they go totally. By the time that that um, uh, King Ahab takes over as the king of the the house of Israel, which is Ephraim. When he becomes king, he totally, through Jezebel, takes them into the biggest um, uh, abomination and where they totally go into idolatry and he builds the altars to the gods, Baal, Asherah, all of that, and they serve the bowls that was from his wife, uh, Jezebel. And from King Ahab... The house of Israel just goes further and further and further into idolatry. And though that is why then the father stays faithful to the house of Judah, because the house of Judah needs to be able to have Yahushua, who's going to come from the house of Judah, who is going to have to be faithful by coming out of the house of Judah, who would eventually return back to the land of Israel. But like I said, they were Faithful, but if we understand in Jeremiah, they too became treacherous. And if we look at Judah now, they have added, added, added to the Father's word, and they themselves are absolutely far away from the Father's word, just like Israel got totally dis- dis- dispersed. And now both houses need Yahushua in order to return and become a house. And so now he turns around in verse 17 and he says, Then bring them together for yourself into one stick, and they shall become one in your hand. So you see, the only way that we can become one in the hand of the Father is when we both have Yahushua, and Yahushua is the only one leading us both. So you cannot have the house of Judah serving Judaism and denying their Messiah and thinking that they are going to take hands with Ephraim, the house of Israel, and them coming with Messiah Yahushua, someone is going to have to bow the knee. And that is why they're raising up these seven Noahid lords in order to be able to then have unity between us. The seven Noahid laws is not in the Bible and it is the biggest deception that's going to come to lead his people astray. Be warned of these seven Noahide laws. There is no such thing as seven Noahide laws in the Bible. There is the Ten Commandments that was given and there is the Torah of Yahuwah that we need to return back to. And that is the Torah by the Spirit written on the tablets of our hearts. And so now he says to them, Thus says the Master Yahuwah, See, I am taking the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, 
his companions, and I shall give them unto him with the stick of Yehuda, and make them one stick, and they shall become one in my hand. So understand, it's both the house of Israel and the house of Judah that becomes one house in the hand of the Father. Not a a people that are in the land right now calling themselves to say, well, we are the original house of Israel, all the tribes of the house of Israel because we are coming back from all these lands. No, no, no. There's going to be two sticks that needs to become one stick. Now listen. And the sticks on which you write shall be in your hand before their eyes. And speak to them. Thus says the Master Yahuwah. See, I'm taking the children of Israel from among the nations wherever they have gone and shall gather them from all around and shall bring them back into their land. So this is what we see being the fulfillment of what's going on in Israel right now. But we need to understand that this is not the fullness of what's written in this word. And so there is a deception. And the deception is that we think that all of this that's going on at the moment is the fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. No, Ezekiel 37 is very specific. And we will tie it in to Jeremiah 32 to understand that this is not now. Because a lot of that which is being gathered now is not at all the Father's people. A lot of them are not true Israelites. They are Khazars. And I shall make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel. And one sovereign shall be sovereign over them. So he is going to gather the full house. The house of Judah and the house of Israel. Right now, those that are in the land, Judah is not allowing brother Israel, Ephraim, to return back to the land because they are the ones that control who may come in and who may not. You have to prove that you are Jewish in order for you to return back to the land. Otherwise, you have to convert to become Jewish, which is then at the end of the day, coming back into into a system because you've got to go through Judaism in order to then return back to the land. You have to come into that in order to return back to the land. And I shall make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel and one sovereign shall be sovereign over them. So they will have one sovereign, one king. And let them no longer be two nations. And let them no longer be divided into two reigns. So you see, they've been two kingdoms. And now they need to become one kingdom. They're not one kingdom yet. And they don't have one sovereign only over them. And it says, And they shall no longer defile themselves. So you see, this is the promise. They shall no longer defile themselves, which means they got to be out of idolatry, out of everything that is there in the land has to be removed. That is not the land that we see right now. That is the promised land of the Father. But what is going on right now is not what is written over here. This is a promise still to be fulfilled. And this, I believe, will only be fulfilled at the millennial reign. When Yeshua comes to be the king over the nation. And they shall no longer defile themselves with their idols nor with their disgusting matters, and that's everything that we see that's going on in the land right now, nor with any of their transgressions, they will continue in their sinful ways. How do you not have transgressions when you don't have the fullness of Messiah? Only the fullness of Messiah is going to come and set us free. So right now, Brother Judah's eyes is still blinded to the fact that they have not received Messiah Yahushua. So until they receive Messiah Yahushua, how are they going to stop their transgressions? And I shall save them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned. And I shall cleanse them and they shall be my people and I shall be their Alua. So he is then going to be able to cleanse them and set them apart. And then listen to what he says. 
while David, my servant, is sovereign over them. So who is David? He's sovereign. David, his servant, that is sovereign over them. And they shall all have one shepherd. So where do they right now in the land of Israel only have one shepherd, one master, one ruler that they listen to? That's not there at the moment. So this is not fulfilled yet. And walk in my right rulings, which means we shall all come back and walk in the right rulings of the Father, which means we will abide and keep his Torah. Right now in the land of Israel, not even many of the Messianic ones that are of the house of Israel returning, many of them don't even walk in his right rulings. And he says, and they will guard my laws and shall do them. So you see, we will come back to his laws. We will come back to his Torah and we will do them. And we will have one, one master over us. So how are we going to be able to be the ones that are part of his house? The true house that's being gathered if we do not want to keep his right rulings and his Torah and his laws. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Yaakov my servant, where your fathers dwelt, and they shall dwell in it, and they and their children, and their children's children forever. And my servant David be prince forever. And I shall make a covenant of peace. Now you see, in the land of Israel right now, there's no peace. So this is not what is the truth of yet the fulfillment of these scriptures. And yet people want to hold to these scriptures and say this is the fulfillment and this is what I follow because this is the fulfillment. No, this is still to come. This, what is there at the moment is what man has formulated. But it's not what Father has orchestrated. It's man-made, man-formulated. Man will always birth man's things first before the true comes. So right now it is the counterfeit before the real. And that is why there will be a counterfeit temple before the real. It says, and I shall make a covenant of peace with them, an everlasting covenant. It is with them. And I shall place them and increase them and shall place my set-apart place in their midst forever. Then he puts his temple in their midst forever. My set-apart place. Listen. And my dwelling place shall be over them and I shall be their allure and they shall be my people. That's not what we see in the land right now. So how can we see, how can we say that this is the fulfillment of scripture that's taking place right now? That's not the fulfillment of scripture. That is man made. Man is trying to birth what it says in the scripture by even going to build their own temple. And the nation shall know that I, Yahuwah, am setting Israel apart when my set-apart place is in their midst forever. So, who is going to bring that set-apart place? Let's go look at, at um, Zechariah chapter 6. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 6 and we are going to see who is going to bring that temple. And it says... Zechariah chapter 6 verses 12 and shall speak to them saying thus said Yahuwah of hosts saying see the man whose name is the branch and from his place he shall branch out and he shall build the heckle of Yahuwah so when Yahushua comes he is going to come and he's going to become he's going to place his dwelling place over them and it says and he who is going to build the heckle of Yahuwah, it is he who is going to bear the splendor. And he shall sit and rule on his throne and shall be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace shall be between, between them both. So there you go. That's the covenant of peace that's going to come according to Zechariah chapter 6. When Yoshua is the one who's going to bring his heckle, his dwelling place, his set-apart place 
that's going to be in their midst and he's going to reign and rule one shepherd over their entire house. And so if we go look then at Jeremiah chapter 32, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 32 and then we read in Jeremiah Jeremiah chapter 32, let's read from verse 37 because this is prophetic in the time to come. See, I'm gathering them out of the, ha- the lands where I have driven them in my displeasure and in my wrath and in great rage. And I shall bring them back to this place and shall let them dwell in safety. Right now, the people that live in the land of Israel do not dwell in safety. They have an iron dome to give them safety because their enemies are all around them and even within their own borders, they have their enemies that dwell with them who want to destroy them. And they shall be my people and I shall be their allure and I shall give them one heart and one way to fear me So you see, the fear of Yahuwah is not upon the people in the land of Israel right now. They do not fear him. To fear me all the days for the good of them and of their children after them. And I shall make an everlasting covenant with them that I do not turn back from doing good to them. And I shall put my fear in their hearts so as not to turn aside from me. And that is exactly what it says in Exodus chapter 2020. You see, we need the 2020 vision. 2020 vision is what he wanted to do in Exodus chapter 2020, which is what Moshe turned around and said, I will put my fear, do not fear, because he wants to put his fear in you. Listen to what he says in Exodus chapter 2020. And Moshe said to the people, do not fear, for a lure has, has come to prove you in order that his fear be, be before you so that you do not sin. So when the Father finally puts his fear in us, then we will no longer sin. But that is not in the land of Israel right now. The fear of Yahuwah is not within the people right now. And I shall rejoice over them to do them good, to do good to them, and shall plant them in this land in truth. So you see, it's going to be a land that will be walking the truth. It's a land of truth, which means the people will walk the truth of his word. And right now, that is not what we see. We do not see a people walking out the truth of his word with all my heart and with all my being. And, and so let's read it again. I shall rejoice over them to do them, to do good to them and shall plant them in this land in truth with all my heart and with all my being. For thus says Yahuwah, I have brought all this great evil on this people, so I am bringing on them all the good that I am speaking to them. So this is the promise of what the Father is going to bring in this house. And so we are seeing he's gathering 12 tribes, and then he's the one who's going to be able to bless them. And so... If we have a look and we finish off with Revelation chapter 14, very interesting. In Revelation chapter 14, this is now when he's going to have sealed off in Revelation chapter 7. He seals off 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of the house of Israel, the full house, the two sticks that are one stick. And I looked and I saw a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written upon their foreheads. And they were sitting on Mount Zion. And I heard a loud, I heard a voice out of heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of Harpers playing their harps, and they sang a renewed song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one was able to learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. So they were those that were sealed. The 144,000 that were sealed with the seal. What was the seal? The Father's name. They were redeemed. These are those who were not defiled with woman, 
for they are maidens. They are those following the Lamb wherever He leads them. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to Allah and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no falsehood, for they are blameless before the throne of Allah. So the Father will have a remnant that he's going to gather. That is the two sticks that are going to become one house. And they are the ones that he's going to gather. And they will return back to the land where they belong. So may Abba bless you all. May you all be blessed in this day. And may you have a wonderful rest of your Shabbat. Let me pray the ironic blessing as we close off. Yevrechecha Yehua Vishmarecha, Yair Yehua Panavelecha, Vichunecha, Yisa Yehua, Panav Elecha Viasem Lecha Shalom. Yehua bless you and keep you. Yehua make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yehua lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. May Abba Yehua bless you all. Shalom, shalom.